Good morning and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Andrew Schwartz, Senior Vice President at CSIS, and uh, I have the pleasure of uh, presiding over this briefing today with two of my favorite colleagues, soon to be three of my favorite colleagues, one of who is, whom is stuck in traffic. Um, we're going to be talking about the President's trip to uh, the G20 Summit, uh, and we will uh, go through this uh, from a couple different angles. But first I'd like to introduce Heather Conley. Uh, senior Fellow and Director of the Europe Program at CSIS. Uh, prior to working at CSIS, Heather served in a variety of positions, including uh, uh, Deputy Assist Assistant Secretary of State for uh, Europe. And with that, I'll let Heather take it. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning. Well, it's hard to believe that Matt and I, two and a half months ago, were sitting before you doing a briefing before the President traveled to Lochern, Ireland and the G8 summit, and we questioned how much Syria would overwhelm the G8 summit. Here we are two months later, uh, and uh, we're now following the President uh, uh, as he makes his way en route to St. Petersburg for the G20 summit, and wondering how much, uh, of course, how much will Syria dominate the corridor conversations. I guess you could summarize the President's uh, unanticipated st uh, stop in Stockholm as Russia's loss and Sweden's gain. Um, after President Obama canceled his bilateral summit uh, with President Putin, um, a stop needed to be added to the itinerary. Um, and looking around the flight path, uh, certainly the Nordic countries came to mind. But of course, President Ho Obama had already been to Copenhagen in 2009 for the UN Climate Conference. He had been to Austria Oslo, Norway to uh, accept his Nobel Prize. Uh, he is welcoming the three presidents of the Baltic states on Friday in the Oval Office, so that canceled out any of the three Baltic states. So Sweden and Finland uh, were certainly the most logical choices, uh, and uh, Stockholm uh, uh, won that choice. Um, this is, in fact, the first uh, time uh, a president has visited Sweden in a bilateral capacity. Uh, president Bush uh, was the first president uh, to visit Sweden. Sweden, I believe, in 2009 in Jotunberg, Sweden, for a U.S.-EU summit. Uh, but this is the first time that uh, we'll have a president uh, visit the capital. President Obama arrives in Sweden and will be greeted by Prime Minister uh, Friedrich Reinfeldt. He has led a center-right government for the last seven years. He will face elections next year. Um, certainly, Sweden has uh, experienced some unsettled times uh, in its own, uh, own challenges dealing with uh, uh, integration of immigrants. If you'll recall, in May, about six days of riots in the suburbs of Stockholm, uh, dealing with a, a police uh, shooting, uh, and continues to be a very great topic of conversation uh, with, with that uh, Im uh, immigration aspect. So certainly uh, that will be part of the uh, domestic conversation. Uh, Prime Minister Reinfeldt has been very gracious and gathering his four other Nordic colleagues to join with President Obama in a dinner uh, the evening uh, after he arrives. And I would sense the conversation uh, will, will be quite robust about the region. And certainly, uh, I hope, uh, and uh, CSIS has been engaged in a four-year uh, study uh, on the Arctic, I think the President may uh, hear quite a bit about the Arctic uh, from his uh, uh, Swedish and Nordic counterparts. Secretary Kerry, as you will recall, uh, was just in Sweden, northern Sweden, in mid-May uh, to attend the Arctic Council Ministerial, where a historic decision was made to welcome uh, several Asian countries as permanent observers to the Arctic Council, we have an, a Chinese cargo ship now passing through the Northern Sea Route. So as the opening of the Arctic happens, uh, the geopolitical dynamics are, are, are changing, and I'm sure the President will, uh, will hear from uh, his colleagues about that. And finally, one, uh, one word on the bilateral discussion uh, between President Obama and the Swedish Prime Minister. Sweden has been an extraordinary ally uh, across a, a range uh, of issues. Uh, they have uh, troop personnel in Afghanistan, approximately 600. Uh, they were on standby for operations in Libya. They've s contributed over 100 troops in Mali. For a neutral country, this is a robust uh, level of engagement. And I think we have certainly appreciated uh, that great solidarity. The breadth of the conversation, clearly uh, Prime Minister Reinfeldt will want to uh, provide President Obama with an update on the European debt crisis, although that has certainly faded uh, from the top of the agenda. Uh, this is going to be the first time 
that the President returns to Europe after his, his visit uh, following the G8 and then to his visit to Berlin, I'm sure he'll hear from his European colleagues about the ramification of the NSA PRISM issue as that continues to uh, uh, be a topic of concern uh, in Europe. Russia will clearly be a topic, and of course, Syria. Egypt, the Middle East, and, and the unrest there. So I believe you'll see a very fulsome bilateral conversation, a more dynamic regional conversation with the Nordic uh, states. And uh, I think it's an excellent preparation to get the president ready as he travels to St. Petersburg to meet with his G8, G20 excuse me, colleagues. And Matt, I'll let you take the baton. Let me introduce Matt real quick, really quickly. Um, Matt Goodman uh, here at CSIS holds our William Simon chair in political economy. Um, the Simon Chair examines current issues in international economic policy uh, with a particular focus on the Asia Pacific. But I should also say that Matt previously served as the White House coordinator for the uh, East Asia Summit for the Asia Pacific Summit. But he also served as director for international economics on the NSC staff and was responsible for the G20, G8, and other international forums. And with that, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague, Matt Goodman. OK, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Heather. Um, so the President will be participating in the 8th G20 Summit uh, on September 5th and 6th in, uh, at the Constantine Palace in Strelna outside St. Petersburg. When Andy gets here, he can tell us how to actually pronounce Strelna um, and not to mention St. Petersburg. Um, uh, he, uh, the, the G20, as you know, just to recap, is, is a gathering of leaders of 19 uh, individual countries and the European Union, uh, which has its own seat, and then another um, uh, five invited guests, including Spain, Singapore, and a couple of African countries that I've uh, 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 forgotten at the moment, Tanzania, I think, uh, Ethiopia, and, and uh, one other. And, um, and, and then a number of international uh, uh, institutions, uh, the UN, the, uh, the IMF, the OECD, and others will, will be in attendance as well. Um, the uh, schedule begins actually with uh, Sherpa meetings, that is the, uh, the leaders, uh, senior uh, economic advisors will meet starting September 2nd uh, together with the finance deputies uh, because the G20 is really uh, built on a finance minister's process, as you know. And uh, so the, the Sherpas and finance deputies uh, uh, will meet um, in parallel and then together uh, in the days leading up to uh, the arrival of the leaders on the 5th. Um, in order to, uh, to, to hammer out the communique and the, and the deliverables, as it were, such as they are. Um, incidentally, this will be the first summit attended by the new um, U.S. Sherpa, Caroline Atkinson, who uh, replaced Mike Froman uh, when he moved over to USTR. Uh, and Mike has been at all the other um, Obama uh, G20 summits. Um, there will probably uh, be uh, well. Let me let me quickly go through what what uh, uh, we understand the schedule to be. This hasn't been formally published, but uh, the leader the the formal summit plenary sessions will begin after lunch on September 5th um, and go through uh, dinner that night. Uh, the next morning, uh, there will be a continuation of discussions, but interrupted. This is a, a small innovation by the Russians. Uh, they are going to have a, an interaction with uh, business leaders uh, during the morning, uh, the, the so-called B20. Uh, there's a proliferation of alphabet uh, groups that, uh, that um, have the 20 after their name, and the B20 is the business grouping, uh, and there will be an interaction that morning, um, and uh, as I understand it, some, some separate uh, bilateral time as well for leaders. Um, and then uh, the meeting will continue through lunch uh, into the sort of mid, mid to late afternoon and, and end with a uh, press conference on September 6th, this is. Um, there will uh, undoubtedly be bilaterals uh, on the side. Uh, President Obama will be involved in. Those have not been announced yet. Um, when Andy gets here, I think he'll tell you that it's unlikely that President uh, Obama and President Putin will have a bilateral, which is the normal practice that uh, um, uh, happens at these summits. Uh, but, uh, but And one can speculate that, that there will probably be um, a summit with the Chinese President, uh, President Xi, and uh, Japanese Prime Minister Abe, but none of that has been, uh, as far as I know, has been um, um, made public. Um, in terms of uh, the agenda, uh, the Russians have uh, laid out um, three, uh, uh, well, one sort of big theme, which is sustainable, inclusive, and balanced growth and creating jobs. 
Uh, and specifically, uh, they have three specific priorities, growth through uh, quality jobs and investment, uh, growth through trust and transparency, and growth through effective regulation. Um, those are all sort of uh, ways of reorganizing and capturing the, the longstanding G20 agenda, which really covers, um, and they even list uh, the eight areas that have traditionally been covered uh, under summits. So those include uh, uh, strong, sustainable, balanced growth, uh, jobs, uh, international financial institution reform, uh, strengthening financial regulation, energy sustainability, development, uh, trade, and anti-corruption. Uh, so all of those things will be, uh, will be on the uh, formal agenda. Not all those things will be talked about by the leaders. Um, and at the end of this, uh, there will be a, a, a probably lengthy uh, communique and then attached documents. The, uh, it, it, it would be um, probably unreasonable to expect that this communique is going to be significantly shorter than the Los Cabos uh, communique, which is the last G20 leaders uh, statement, which uh, was ran to 85 paragraphs. Um, I, I would be surprised if it was uh, significantly shorter than that because um, it has to cover all of the topics I mentioned. Um, what the leaders will really talk about um, probably will revolve around, um, in addition to Syria, which will not be on the formal agenda, th this grouping, unlike the G8, really does not have a formal place for discussion of uh, broad geopolitical issues. But of course, inevitably, um, it is going to dominate the, the corridor conversations. Um, in, the, in the actual uh, sessions among leaders, the agenda so the formal agenda will, will cover economic and, and economic related issues. Um, and I would say probably uh, uh, three or four big topics. Obviously, the, the global economy will, will dominate. Um, you'll have uh, some European, uh, and here's Andy uh, joining us. Great, great, good timing. I'm, I'm stalling here, Andy, just to, uh, to, to make it. Um, Dr. So, Andy Cutchins, ladies and gentlemen. There we go. Yeah. Um, so the, um, the, the Europeans will obviously probably uh, crow a little bit about their second quarter GDP uh, numbers, which were positive for the first time in eight or nine quarters, I think. Um, uh, the U.S. will probably still uh, express concern about the fact that, that while the U.S. economy is doing better, um, it cannot be the only engine of growth in the global economy, and it will express concern about uh, the risks and the, the, uh, the imbalances which remain in the, in the global economy. Emerging markets are probably going to talk about uh, the, the financial market volatility, which they attribute in, in large part to the uh, concerns about tapering uh, by the uh, U.S. and uh, the U.S. Fed and other monetary authorities um, from this um, extraordinary period of monetary uh, easing, which they also were uncomfortable with precisely because it created these sorts of uh, financial uh, risks. Um, the, the advanced countries will probably push back that those uh, those things, are the, those reactions in the markets are, first of all, a natural uh, consequence of, of uh, strategies by these countries, the U.S. and Japan and, and uh, European countries, to keep uh, the economies growing. And, uh, and uh, inevitably, these, these policies are going to have to uh, have to end. Uh, they will also argue that a lot of the problems in emerging markets are homegrown. So the problems in India or Brazil or other countries are. are um, uh, come, uh, uh, are, as I say, are homegrown. Um, this issue is not going to be resolved, but I'd say on balance, uh, and and I would, and I think it's fair to say also that there is, as as that little discussion has ju has just uh, revealed, that there is not the same sort of sense of of uh, consensus and uh, shared sense of crisis in the group. Um, although I think the sense of crisis generally may be starting to uh, pick up again, but not everybody agrees on what uh, the causes or solutions to that, uh, those issues are. Um, uh, but overall, um, I think it will be, um, it will be a largely a conversation uh, about those issues. There will also probably be a, a significant amount of discussion of international tax cooperation, both to deal with tax evasion um, and tax avoidance. This was a major theme at the G8 summit, um, and certainly the G8 members are going to uh, uh, be interested in, in talking about those issues, um, and, and potentially there could be, there won't be any kind of breakthrough agreements, but there could be a reinforcement of some of the work uh, that was agreed to in the G8, uh, OECD um, work on, on tax sharing, information sharing, and so forth. Um, and then a third area would be trade. Um, I think that there will be a fairly robust discussion of trade. The, G8, the G20 has um, uh, several times now uh, laid down a, um, 
uh, a commitment, a standstill against protectionist measures, uh, which they've most recently extended through 2014, and they may and likely to uh, re, uh, re up that. Of course, uh, this commitment has been honored in the breach, but, uh, but they will probably make a strong stand. They will also talk about the Doha round. I think at this point, um, the main focus is on the Bali uh, ministerial in December, uh, which is uh, the last real chance, I think, to potentially save a Doha round. Uh, but most people, I think, in the trade world don't think that that's likely to happen, that, that, that there may be a more focused uh, focus look at what the G20 can do to push uh, forward specific agreements in Bali, say on trade facilitation, for example. Uh, but whether that's going to um, uh, progress or not uh, remains to be seen. Uh, and then there may be just some discussion about development issues, food security, uh, infrastructure investment, and so forth. Um, finally, I'll wrap up and let Andy uh, talk about the, the interesting stuff in Russia. Um, but, uh, but I would just say I, I think that the, uh, the White House certainly still feels the G20 is an important forum. Uh, it's it's uh, the only uh, forum in which uh, the leaders of uh, what a uh, group of countries that represent 85 percent of the global economy can get together and talk about uh, the, both the short-term risks to global growth and the longer-term uh, uh, challenges of, of sustained and balanced growth. Um, and uh, it is an opportunity to sort of broadly set the agenda for uh, the global economy um, and uh, finally to build habits of cooperation among the members of the group that have not had the same experience that the G8 countries in particular have had in guiding these issues. So I think broadly uh, this is still a trip that, that the um, uh, Syria notwithstanding that, that the president uh, looks forward to as, as an opportunity to engage on, on this set of issues. So I'll stop there and turn it to Andy. Dr. Cutchins is our, uh, the director of our, U our Russia and Eurasia program, and uh, he will put forth what's uh, going on with the Russians. Uh, thanks, Andrew, and uh, my apologies <clears throat> for being late. Um, unlike Mr. Putin last year in deciding not to come to the G8, and unlike uh, Mr. Obama deciding not to meet Mr. Putin uh, in Moscow, I did decide to come to the press briefing today. It's kind of an odd role. Um, you know, in Russian literature, there's a, uh, a tradition of uh, the Lishni Chelevyek, um, the superfluous man. And uh, in some ways, you've, I feel a bit like a superfluous man talking about a meeting that is not going to happen. Um, but in a relationship which, frankly, um, is not in a good place. How's that for an exciting quote? Um, some might call it a train wreck. It's been like watching a slow-moving train wreck for nearly two years uh, right now. Uh, what's the good news? Well, the good news is that this is not the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, the good news is that this is not even the Georgia War of five, five years ago, in which one could have imagined the possibility of US and Russian military forces uh, perhaps by accident, uh, coming into uh, conflict with each other uh, in the in the Black Sea. Um, but one thing is clear to me that this is the worst personal relationship between U.S. and Russian, perhaps even U.S. and Soviet leaders, uh, in history. Um, and one has to kind of think about, you know, what. Uh, what does that mean? What does that, uh, what does that uh, uh, hurt in the relationship? Um, I really think these two guys, Mr. Putin and Mr. Obama, uh, don't like each other at all. Um, I think there's a deep degree of uh, disrespect. Um, I think when, uh, when our president uh, says something like comparing Mr. Putin to the, the kid in the back of the classroom, kind of slouching, not really interested in things. Well, you've taken the, you've taken the relationship to a personal level, uh, even more so, I think, than the comment he made, uh, which was, a mis I think, a mistake four years ago, uh, that Mr. Putin had one foot uh, in the Cold War and one foot you know, in, the, in the future. Um, Mr. Putin uh, is not a person that, uh, that forgets, uh, I think, any personal insults and uh, certainly has not uh, played well in the relationship. But um, 
And it's it's something to th th think to think th think about. Uh, I mean, really, uh, I, I don't think there's been a case uh, even in in, uh, in the Soviet period. Obviously, Mr. Lenin didn't meet with any American leaders that I know of. Uh, we know about the relationship between Uncle Joe and uh, FDR, uh, but clearly, to me, this is this is the worst personal relationship of a U.S. and Russian leader uh, in history, and um, I think that's uh, that's obviously not a not a good thing. Let's look at a little bit more at the, the recent history. Now, the Obama administration made an effort in the, in the spring and early summer to engage Russia to try to put the relationship that was obviously for a number of reasons that I think are clear to everyone in this room that was, that was on the rocks and, uh, uh, and, and getting worse. Um, but basically, Mr. Putin was not interested in what the Obama administration was trying to sell him. And I think essentially what the, uh, the effort to engage Mr. Putin was principally around the issue of uh, further uh, cuts in offensive nuclear arms, uh, tied to some kind of uh, agreement about or modus vivendi on missile defense, um, and that was that was a uh, like I said that was a deal that Mr. Putin had decided he just was not particularly interested in. Um, I think that is what the uh, uh, the effort uh, begun with the, the trip of uh, former uh, National Security Advisor Tom Donilon to uh, to Moscow. Uh, in the spring was about mainly, um, and that's what this uh, this effort to to bring uh, to bring uh, the two sides together. Now, I mean, it was pretty clear from the G8 meeting, that <laughs> just looking at the body posture, as to what, what how much that can actually tell us, we don't know, but uh, it was a pretty powerful statement. But you have to wonder, you know, what was the thinking of the in uh, the administration at the time that gave them some degree of hope and optimism that there would be enough of an agree enough to agree on uh, at a meeting uh, uh, to justify a summit meeting in in September um, you know I don't know exactly but uh, it looks to have been a mis miscalculation and then of course we have to factor in you know just how much of an effect uh, the Snowden affair had on the decision to uh, to cancel the uh, the summit now the Snowden affair um, you know I was not particularly impressed with the way uh, it was handled on our side, to be frank. I think there was far too uh, uh, much so-called public diplomacy, if you want to call public demands uh, diplomacy. Uh, and I don't think there was adequate uh, uh, behind-the-scenes, backdoor communication between the administrations at a high enough level to make some kind of face-saving deal possible, if indeed that were possible in the, in the first place. You know, I think, to me, I constantly ask myself the question, let's imagine that uh, Edward Snowdenoff arrived in Dulles Airport with the same kind of information about uh, the uh, domestic and foreign surveillance system that the Russian Federation was using. Uh, you know, would we have extradited him back to Russia? I think almost, <laughs> I think it's almost impossible to imagine that we would have done that. Uh, and so it does make me wonder, why did we think that the Russians would, would do it in this case? Um, uh, I think, I don't know this for sure, but my, my sense is that the administration thought that uh, they were making progress in these discussions through law enforcement uh, channels. Um, but frankly, you know, this was a case where I think uh, if there was an opportunity to resolve this, um, the only way that you could have done it, I think, was for Mr. Obama to pick up the telephone and have some very, uh, you know, frank conversations with, uh, with Mr. Putin and try to work it through uh, a personal relationship and try to find some kind of face-saving solution. But I won't go, I won't beat that, uh, well, the horse is not quite dead yet, but <clears throat> I won't uh, belabor that point any longer because, frankly, you know, we don't, you know, we don't know whether there would have been a summit if there hadn't been a Snowden affair. Uh, you know, if in fact it was the decision that uh, there wasn't adequate progress on key issues in the bilateral relationship. We don't know, and we're not likely to find out for, for quite a quite a long time. Um, where do we go from here? Um, gosh, it's pretty tough to find uh, a way in which, or find a reason for which either leadership is going to, um, you know, want to find uh, or see the incentives for themselves to, uh, to resurrect the relationship. 
I think it's very likely that we could see this, uh, this relationship uh, muddle along uh, at this uh, you know, very, very kind of uh, unpleasant level for the next uh, three years, uh, you know, until we're looking at a new uh, administration in the United States. Uh, and who knows how long we're going to be looking at uh, the same administration uh, in, in Moscow. So um, just to uh, cut it short, uh, <laughs> always try to find some kind of silver, silver lining uh, in, in this one. Well, okay, here, I'll just pull one out of left field for you, okay? Because it's not really about the U.S.-Russian relationship. There are some interesting things going, actually, in the, uh, the Russo-Japanese relationship. Uh, and, um, you know, I thought that one of the reasons why Mr. Putin and the Russians had some incentive to try to improve their ties with the United States going back four years ago was their concern about the growing power of, of, of China and that they would like to have a more balanced foreign, foreign policy. Well, it looks like I think Mr. Putin is trying to address, you know, his concerns about the possibility of being over leveraged to China in other ways. And I think the uh, the Russo-Japanese relationship uh, is number one on number one on the list. Now, I'm not going to make the prediction that the uh, the Northern Territory issue is going to be resolved, but I would say I think that the possibility of resolution of this long-standing issue, now 68 years, is greater than I've seen at any time in the last uh, 25 years or so that I've been that I've been been following it. Uh, you have two leaderships in both countries that are relatively relatively strong domestically, which I think is think is necessary, and I think both have the the outside factor of their concern uh, increasing about uh, Chinese ac activities, and uh, we may uh, see this uh, finally in the next uh, year or so lead to uh, a breakthrough in that relationship, which would frankly be good for the the U.S. Russia relationship uh, as as well. So uh, with that note from left field, uh, trying to bring some optimism in the discussion, uh, let me uh, uh, finish my uh, prepared remarks. Thanks. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions in just a second. Um, if you could identify yourself, and if you're at the table, please speak into the microphone. Um, this briefing will be available in transcript form uh, later today. I'll mail it out. I also want to assure you that um, we still do have a board of trustees. Uh, as many of you know, you know, Dr. Brzezinski's around, Dr. Kissinger's around. We're moving uh, our office in a couple of weeks, so that's why we have uh, such sort of uh, empty, emptiness here. Uh, our new building will be at 1616 Rhode Island Avenue, and you can follow us on Twitter at CSIS uh, for more updates about that. But it's an exciting moment in the 50-year history of CSIS, and we're looking forward. To, actually, I think this will probably be the last press briefing we do in this old building. So thank you again for being here. With that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, right here. Dmitry Kirsanov of Itartas. Um, I would like to ask the members of the panel to put a little more meat on the issue of what's going to happen next in the bilateral uh, relationship. And since Mr. Goodman mentioned that probably there will be no bilateral meeting between presidents. Andy would confirm <laughs> whether there would be well, one, but I would like to, to hear that. that there uh, is there any chances that? this summit might be a warming off point or none at all? Um, thanks, Dimitri, for the, for the, for the question. Uh, I was thinking this morning it would, uh, I, I th you know, it could be a statesman-like statesman -like move uh, on the part of uh, uh, President Obama in particular, since uh, it was the United States that canceled the, uh, the summit meeting. Uh, to request a one-on-one uh, -on -one bilateral meeting with, uh, with President, President Putin. Um, but I think the chances of that happening are um, less than 5 percent, slim to, slim to none. Um, I think there's a there's a high degree of anger uh, on the part of the Obama administration about relations with Russia, and I think about Mr. Obama in particular in his personal regard for uh, for Mr. Mr. Putin, and I think that's that's what that comment about the uh, the personal comment about the slouching kid in the back at the back of the room. It seems. Uh, with that, it, it's harder to imagine that you could see them pivot 
and kind of walk back and make the decision, well, in fact, we would like to meet with you. There would have, you know, maybe the situation in Syria, uh, which is extremely grave and dangerous, uh, could, could justify that. But um, questions? Roger, did you? Yeah. Um. Speak into the microphone. Please. Roger Running and Bloomberg News. What are going to be the deliverables for e any of you? You know, on the on the stop Stockholm stop, I'm not sure there's really going to be a, a deliverable other than a, a, a an underscoring of uh, both the strong bilateral ties as well as our regional engagement. I mean, for the president to visit with his, the Nordic colleagues as well as to see the Baltic presidents in the span of a week really speaks to I think a, a deeper regional engagement, which is which is very welcome. Um, I think there w it will be an opportunity to. Um, uh, for the for the Stockholm stop to really hear uh, from five uh, European leaders, some within the EU, some just within NATO, their concerns obviously about uh, uh, Syria and the regional issues. I think there will be an extraordinary amount of outreach in the corridors uh, of the G20 summit with David Cameron, with Francois Hollande, with the European colleagues as this gets uh, closer. We just saw reports this morning that uh, Prime Minister Cameron has uh, recalled uh, the British Parliament back in session on Thursday to discuss this. So this, this tells me we're going to see a, a very intense dialogue. And in some ways, that Stockholm visit is a good preview uh, of those issues. And to sort of tap on the, the first question, certainly it's not just U.S.-Russian bilateral relations that are, that are undergoing some reassessment. The uh, European-Russian relations also. Uh, there have been challenges uh, both with uh, visa liberalization questions, energy issues. Uh, and I think the Europeans themselves are, are deeply examining what uh, what the health and future state of Russian democracy, human rights, civil society, and what it means for their relationship. So it's an important <clears throat> moment for consultation transatlantically uh, uh, about uh, Russia as well. And I would suspect you'll hear, uh, with the exception of uh, Norway, which is not a member of the EU, another strong statement for the transatlantic trade and investment partnership that will echo the theme of trade for the G20. Uh, and I think you'll hear uh, certainly from the Swedish side, how critical that will be uh, for U.S. transatlantic uh, relations. Um, well, as, as I implied, but I guess I didn't state explicitly, so thanks for the question. I, I wouldn't expect some major headline deliverables out of the G20 summit. Um, I think that has not been the pattern in the recent past, and uh, so certainly if you're looking for large headline numbers or, uh, you know, initiatives, I wouldn't expect uh, that. Um, but, you know, as I say, in an 85-plus paragraph communique, there will be a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of hortatory language about, you know, growth and, and the importance of, and I would say a, a tilt towards, you know, growth versus austerity. That, that tilt has been happening in the last um, few uh, meetings of, of G20 um, folks at the leader and finance ministry level, and that will, uh, that will uh, you'll see that, I think, again here, um, you know, but of course, talk about the other aspects of the global economy I mentioned. You know, uh, an affirmation of all the things that the finance ministers have been doing on financial regulation, which I didn't really harp on, but because the leaders won't probably talk about that stuff in the room, but there'll be, you know, paragraphs about uh, progress on Basel III and, and OTC derivatives regulation and other things. Um, as I said, the tax, uh, the tax pieces, um, the tax avoidance and tax evasion, um, uh, issues I think will be featured, um, and and for the specifics on that, I'd, I'd refer you actually on all of this. Go back to the finance minister's uh, communique of July 20th or something, uh, uh, which uh, which I think is really what you'll find uh, the leaders uh, embracing and endorsing uh, mostly across the board. So I, I don't think I, I'd be surprised if there were any dramatic breakthroughs on on anything. But you know, again, a lot of this is about the conversation and and trying to get people on the same page and moving in the same. Uh, direction on global economic and financial uh, issues. No meeting, no deliverables. Got it. Uh, <laughs> I would just simple add, though, and sweet. The uh, I we have, we have to kind of wonder about um, the likelihood of, of U.S. military strike on on Syria has obviously increased very significantly, and uh, imagine the G20 meeting taking place uh, right after that. Uh, perhaps. Um, so it, 
that the, the mood of the principal, the principal players, the Europeans, the United States, the Russians, and Chinese, is going to would have to think would be very, very sour, uh, and I can't, I can't think that's going to you know help um, just the the G20 meeting itself. Um, Questions? Yes, right here. Yeah, uh, uh, Paul Lewis from the Guardian newspaper. Um, Andrew, if you could follow up on that. Uh, two things. One, you said that it wasn't clear to you that the Snowden affair was, uh, the, the, the bilateral summit would have occurred had it not been uh, for the St Snowden affair. But, but all of the noises you heard from the White House in the run-up to the Snowden affair was that the meeting what was likely to take place. And it was only after um, Russia uh, agreed to give him temporary sanctuary that, that the meeting was cancelled. So w what else could account for the cancellation of that bilateral meeting? And, and uh, another question for Matthew is, could you talk to us a bit more about um, how corridor conversations about Syria may impact the more formal meetings? <clears throat> I think um, the administration, though, uh, faced a, a dilemma um, and you sort of try to factor out that the Snowden affair and that the, uh, the principal proposals that they've been making to the Russians on not just uh, security issues and, and principally the, uh, uh, the nuclear uh, offensive reductions, missile defense, strategic stability uh, set of issues, which I think is the sort of the foremost area they wanted to make progress on. This is the area that, you know, Mr. Obama just made the, uh, the Berlin speech. Um, Russians yawned, uh, and uh, there was no response to those proposals that Mr. Donilon brought in. And from what administration officials told me, there have been no responses to other things that we've been pr proposing, including in the area of economic cooperation and trade, where at least there rhetorically for the last uh, year or so, the, the two administrations have been singing virtually from the same so song sheet that we want to have a, a broader economic relationship as this would provide some ballast for the bilateral relationship in, in rocky times and provide more constituencies in each country to support the relationship. But uh, my sense was that the administration was kind of getting uh, no response uh, really across the board. Um, so, you know, uh, Snowden doesn't happen, you know, uh, certainly they would have made every effort, I think, to to try to uh, try to carry on and have and have the meeting, but it's uh, it's just, you know, you have to ask yourself, well, what's the point? You know, we don't really need a photo, op a, a photo opportunity. And you look at where we are on a, on a whole set of, of issues. And, I mean, Syria, obviously. Iran, it's very clear that uh, the Russians don't want to go any further with, uh, with sanctions on, on Iran. The area that we have the most common interest, Afghanistan, well, the problem there is that we still don't have a, a bilateral security agreement with the Afghans, so we can't really talk to the Russians and others about, you know, what we envision uh, to be uh, the future, future potential for cooperation and, and uh, in a kind of a multilateral context. You know, one, one of the disadvantages of being a world leader and, and maybe a journalist as well is that you have to walk and chew gum at the same time, you have to be able to cover a wide range of issues. Um, and I think in this case, um, in a formal sense, as I said, uh, the G20 is not about geopolitical issues, and so Syria will not be on the formal agenda. Uh, I would be very, I mean, it's possible, but very unlikely that the Russians would introduce it into the agenda of the formal meetings, um, or that some member would raise their hand and say, I want to talk about Syria. Um, all of that said, um, all of that said, of course, it is going to be, uh, it's going to have a huge impact in terms of, again, what's being talked about in the corridors, uh, which I expect it would be the dominant topic there. Um, and uh, and as, as Andy said, I think it will affect the kind of mood in the room. I don't think there will be a sense of great camaraderie and uh, let's get stuff done together because um, uh, on the global economy, on even on these other issues. Um, so I, I think uh, it will have a, it will have an effect, but but in a formal sense, it won't be it won't be part of the the, the G20 delibera deliberations. Well, well, Matt, I'm reminded at the the G20 in September of '09 in Pittsburgh that the G20 was used as a backdrop for then Gordon Brown and Nicolas Sarkozy and President Obama to announce about the Iranian uh, disclosures. So it can be used, uh, obviously, with the media watching a platform to oh, sure. advance. So I'm wondering if we'll see a lot of. Uh, 
perhaps some press yeah, conferences yeah, yeah. that Sorry. will will to some of this. So it can be used Again, on occasion. Again, one of the advantages of being a specialist, I do the G20, so I don't have to worry about uh, important things like um, Russia and Syria uh, so much. I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think that there, there very well may be things on the margins where people pull aside, certainly to talk, but possibly to say things, announce things. Um, but I just in a formal G20 sense, there, there won't, I, I, I don't think it will be in the communique. My image for this summit is kind of the hold your nose summit um, for a lot of the participants. That's the headline. Like, like baton death march. Questions? Scott. Um, actually, I, I disagree with the, the assessment uh, as well. But I think the, the larger mistake was to say was to say it publicly, and I think that uh, um, I think it was a little bit too maybe a cavalier assumption that uh, Mr. Putin was not uh, as significant of a of a policymaker uh, as he actually was, uh, and or the possibility that Mr. Putin would uh, would return as as a as a future as the future de facto and de jure leader of the Russian Federation. On uh, my view on, on Putin, it's not so much that he has a, a, a foot in the Cold War. I think that uh, he's been more affected by, you know, what he's seen with U.S. behavior after the Cold War. Uh, and in the 1990s, I think, and he, he reflects a, a very broad kind of consensus in Russia that uh, the United States in particular, uh, the West more broadly, was taking advantage of Russia during a period of historical weakness. Um, and a lot of the uh, sort of developments in the, particularly in the international security system, uh, sort of NATO expansion being a, being a big one, uh, and, and uh, the, the experience of the Serbia war in, in particular, uh, with the US in their, Russia's view, op operating outside of inter international law, had a deep impact on, on Putin. And then subsequently, I think, uh, a, maybe, maybe even a deeper impact was, um, you know, after 9-11, uh, when the Russians worked uh, closely with us and others to uh, take out the, uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, and there was a sense that uh, this, was a, this was a high point in U.S.-Russia relations probably in the last, last 20 years, uh, even talk of possible alliance and uh, the such. Uh, I think Mr. Putin uh, felt that uh, the Bush administration subsequently um, really didn't reciprocate or didn't really you know, kind of acknowledge Russian interests on a, on a whole series of issues, uh, particularly uh, walking away from the ABM treaty and missile missile defense, and again, NATO, NATO expansion and, and other things. And uh, uh, it's, so it's that sense of, uh, of grievances that built up uh, in Putin that I think are actually much more significant than, uh, than the impact of the Cold War. Questions? Uh, Josh. Well, I think he will certainly hear uh, concerns expressed uh, in his conversations in Stockholm, both bilaterally as well as with the, the dinner with, with the Nordic uh, uh, heads of government. Um, clearly, I think the focal point within Europe is Germany. Um, and this has had significant uh, ramifications uh, both prior to the German election, national elections on September the 22nd, but, but also I think it goes much deeper. And uh, I think initially as the, uh, as the documents were released, there was a sense from the administration of just sort of being dismissive about it that, you know, b b everyone engages in this practice, uh, you know, th this emotionalism hysteria that was coming just needed to be downplayed. Well, actually it's now taken deep root and it's impacting the transatlantic relationship, particularly, again, the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, TTIP, where you now have statements, uh, certainly, again, uh, being most forcefully expressed uh, by uh, Berlin.
in, both opposition as well as government officials, saying we can't move forward with this trade until we get uh, much uh, more rigorous uh, both transparency on the NSA programs, but in the case of Germany, a, a, a new agreement that the U.S. will not spy on Germany. So this is not going away. It's not even going away after the German election, quite frankly. It will continue. It needs to be taken very seriously. Uh, there is now a, a real a breach in confidence and trust that we have to manage uh, and, and work through so we can get back to uh, working on uh, the bilateral uh, engagement and agenda, and first and foremost, is that TTIP is that trade and investment. We can't allow this issue to sideline that. And right now, you know, it, it has the potential to do that. So he certainly will hear it. And he may, if he uh, has an opportunity to have a sideline discussion, which I assume he will with Chancellor Merkel um, uh, in the quarters of, of the G20, he may hear additional words on that. Well, it's a the revelations of the, of the program are, I think, are hard to under, underestimate as a, as a blow to, you know, U.S. credibility uh, as a moral leader uh, in many places. And it plays in perfectly into the hands of, of the Russians and to the Chinese, I think. Um, you know, just the, the, the fact that, and even, you know, in the United States, I mean, Edward Snowden is viewed by a very significant part of the pop population as a, uh, you know, is doing the right thing. Um, and so you can imagine what the view is in other countries. And so in other countries in which we uh, repeatedly are very uh, uh, watching very carefully their violations of human, human rights, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a big PR, public relations gift, I think. Uh, and the irony that, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Mr. Snowden uh, goes to China and Russia, uh, which are certainly, uh, uh, you know, I think taking more intrusive measures uh, to surveil their own citizens. Uh, the, the irony is is kind of kind of staggering. Question, Paul. Just a, a follow up question on that. Um, w one of the significant disclosures from uh, Snowden has been the extent and depth of surveillance at these summits. Um, uh, <laughs> The Germans, at least, appear to have been genuinely surprised that the NSA, which supposedly deals with terrorism, is, is spying on, on its diplomats. What, what impact will that have on this summit and both the practicalities and the way in which um, uh, leaders will approach it? Yay, yeah. Um, interesting. I mean, I think that's another data point in the whole that that broader conversation i and i you know and i assume to your point about practical issues that you know every delegation's security team and you know it team will be a little more uh, vigilant uh, i mean i don't i don't really know how to answer the question because i think it is it's part of the broader conversation and the tensions that um, heather and andy have have um, have talked about i, I don't think it I mean, as I sit here trying to answer your question, I don't see any kind of profound impact on the G20 conversation itself. Um, but you know, it, it, but it is a it's an issue among the members who are there, and so it'll be part of that conversation. Yes, right over here. Hi, I'm Kazarki from Kyoto News. I have a question on Japan's raising increase raising consumer tax. Uh, Mr. Goodman, how much degree you the, the G20 is interested in this issue? And, uh, well, the communique mentioned this. Unless Japan wants it to be mentioned as a specific example of how Japan is taking on uh, its fiscal challenges, um, it will almost certainly not be mentioned. Um, this is this um, uh, decision that Prime Minister Abe has to make uh, about whether to increase, as uh, planned and legislated, um, uh, a, an increase in their uh, value-added tax, the so-called consumption tax, uh, uh, which he may, a decision he may make. Well, he probably won't make it before that that summit, but he may make it in in September. Um, and so, uh, no, I mean, I think there will be a broader conversation about what countries are doing to uh, to consolidate their fiscal positions and and the timing and sequencing and pacing of of, of that uh, those moves, but but not a, a specific conversation in the G20 about uh, about that issue. Um, if Prime Minister. Abe meets with President Obama, no doubt Prime Minister Abe is going to talk about that, but 
again, I don't think it would be part of the formal output of even a bilateral meeting between the two. Great, right and back. Hi, I'm uh, Ann Walters. I'm with the German press agency, DPA. Uh, you mentioned the upcoming German elections in conjunction with the NSA scandal. Um, I was wondering if any of you saw any potential other impacts of those elections um, on broader conversations of the G20, perhaps in the growth versus austerity discussions or anything along those lines. Well, I think in some ways, as Matt reflected, this will be one of the first uh, G20 conversations where the Euro crisis is not very much front and center of the conversation of how Europe is uh, uh, addressing this. This has been a I would argue a pause in the crisis. Hopefully we're seeing some early signs of healing, uh, but I think uh, we are far from over, and that's certainly been part of the conversation in recent days with uh, Minister Schleib was suggesting that the Greek package will have to be reassessed and, and, you know, obviously some continued concerns about the health of the French economy. So the Euro crisis has taken a pause, but I, you know, it will return back to, to the conversation. It is a, a legitimate question, what certainly a reoccurring theme since 2009 has been this rebalancing initiative of the current account surplus countries versus the deficit countries, and that certainly puts Germany and China squarely in that, the surplus camp, and needing to find that, that rebalancing. I would argue, and looking at the CDU platform, we are seeing a, a bit of stimulus in the German uh, perspective of, of encouraging additional spending, uh, but this is certainly not going to address um, the, the, the concerns of the enormous current account surplus that the Germany uh, currently holds. I would not suspect, uh, I, what I guess I, watching very closely is how Syria could potentially uh, impact uh, the German elections and that conversation as the uh, Merkel spokesman yesterday came out uh, with a very strong statement of support that uh, action must be taken and that was uh, firmly supportive. So I'm wondering how that issue may or may not play in, but this has been a very quiet and subdued German election with very few issues other than the NSA PRISM uh, issue being forced first and foremost, so I don't anticipate uh, extraordinary volatility uh, leading up to September 22nd. And just, just very quickly, I just say I think Heather's right. I think that the the euro uh, crisis is no longer, you know, front and center as the the main issue for the G20 uh, leaders to discuss uh, at this summit. Uh, but elements of, uh, well, A, I guess I'd first say, I, I think certainly the U.S. and, and probably others are, are not going to be quite as comforted by one quarter's um, uh, barrel, you know, modestly positive growth we'll and, in thinking that the, the overall crisis is solved. And second, um, I think there will be elements of the Euro situation, including Germany's 6, 7 percent of GDP current account surplus that will appear in the rebalancing conversation, or banking union will, will be something that people will be interested in and the progress on that in the financial discussion. So it will, it will emerge, but it won't be the central uh, theme, I think, of the, of the conversation. Can you speak into the microphone, please? Oh. My name is Igarashi from Masahi. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about uh, fiscal consolidation, too. Uh, I think, uh, you know, G20 company, uh, countries are expected to set some kind of targets for their government debts after 2016. So how much do you think, how much dominant will this discussion on fiscal policy, I mean, fiscal consolidation? Well, again, I mean, fiscal consolidation has been part of the conversation uh, at the G20 um, since, I mean, in some sense since the beginning, but certainly since the Toronto summit in 2010, um, where there were those commitments to, uh, to reducing fiscal uh, uh, deficits and debt um, uh, that, were, that were laid out. I mean, since that, that was partly because I think there was a little bit more optimism at that point in 2010 that the, the worst of the crisis was over and that things were beginning to, to pull back up. And so it was time to start focusing on what I think everyone agrees is a, is a, a critical medium-term challenge for, for many countries in the G20. Um, but I think the debate has shifted over time, partly because growth has not performed as well as people hoped in, in the first part of 2010. Um, partly because I think the impact of some of the, the more austere policies that some members of the G20 have pursued have ended up, you know, fairly, you know, ostensibly hurting uh, growth, and, and I think there have been domestic debates that have shifted. And so I think the conversation is a little different now, and it's more about, yes, we need to do medium-term uh, consolidation, but in the short term, the priority, and I expect the, the first or, se well, the first sentence of the communique will be, we met 
in Strelna, uh, um, um, in um, outside St. Petersburg, uh, the second paragraph will be growth and jobs are our top priority, and uh, and that's a that's a s subtle shift from from earlier. Well, it's it's again been in the last couple of communiques, but but uh, I think that's going to be the focus: growth and jobs versus um, uh, immediate you know fiscal uh, consolidation or austerity. Um, so. I was personally tickled. We've now rebranded it growth-friendly fiscal consolidation. So I think uh, uh, we're seeing that, that sensitivity balance. But again, just in the European context, we have the fiscal compact treaty where debt breaks or, or constitutional requirements for balanced budgets will start coming into play in 2016. Again, that will in some ways uh, impact uh, the, the leeway for uh, uh, stimulus spending and it cements uh, legally uh, fiscal consolidation. Additional questions? With that, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to our briefing this morning. Uh, again, um, follow us on Twitter, at CSIS, um, for uh, updates on when the transcript will be available. Should be available later today. We'll be mailing it out to all of you. Uh, thank you again, and uh, we'll see you soon.